means a lot to us to have you come, uh, especially since it's so much exciting is going on on the floor of the uh, convention. And so it's, it's hard to get, get away from it, but we're just really thrilled to have you and we welcome you. My name is Sharon Harris and Terry's going to formally introduce me in a second, so I'm going to introduce Terry. Uh, Terry Brock is going to tell you more about himself, but I just want you to know he is in the Hall of Fame for the National Speakers Association. He also runs Freedom Fast TV, and uh, maybe he'll tell us a little bit more about that, but it's really exciting. And so I want you to welcome Terry Brock. Thank you, sir. Wow, great to be here today, because we're seeing so much change taking place. And now we get a chance to talk about it, particularly how you can talk with Democrats. There's so much happening, and I get a chance to talk a lot. Myself, as Sharon mentioned, I uh, work with speakers, and I do a lot at the National Speakers Association. And as a syndicated columnist, I also get to write for a lot of papers around the country. So I'm looking uh, at where we are today and what's going on. I think it's an exciting time to be alive. And so we're going to make sure that we focus on what's going on, and also this is going to go beyond politics. We wanted to address the political area, but also how you can connect with people who might be on more of that, oh, so we say they call themselves Democrats in this country, or it might be the labor over in Australia or the UK or other places. Uh, progressives is sometimes a term they like to use. They like to um, sometimes be known as uh, collectivists or socialists, communists sometimes, you know, there are a lot of variations in all that. So we want to talk about it because we see things changing a lot today. Have you noticed that? I mean, this election in particular, I mean, not just what we're seeing here, but what we're seeing with the campaign right now, and I think it is different than any election that I've seen in American history, when you think about it, including the election of 1800, 1824, 1800 was the second American Revolution, according to Thomas Jefferson. And we saw things changing then, and the animosity that they had. But right now, we're seeing a lot going on in so many areas. Matter of fact, we're even seeing, I think it's fun to see how things are changing. It's not the way that it used to be. Actually, it kind of reminds me, I remember a while back, I was in St. Petersburg, Russia, and I was walking down a street called Nevsky Prospect. You went to Russia before? I highly recommend that. Get over there, take a look at it. But there was a sign that I saw, I thought it was really appropriate. It said, vodka, it's not just for breakfast anymore. <laughs> I like these Russians, this is good. Things are changing a little bit here. And we're seeing it change quite a matter of fact. Did you notice, I was, I was noticing, that the government is now getting involved in the public restrooms? Have you noticed that? Now they're saying they're going to debating on the public restroom. I don't know how that's going to turn out, but I can guarantee it, if the government's involved, the lines are going to be a lot longer. <laughs> It just tends to work that way, you know, when you see that, you know, and then, then, what was it, this last week? Somebody might see that, did you see how they threw out the head of the TSA? Yeah, they threw the head of the TSA, they threw him out, and, and just to rub it in, they made him fly home. <laughs> really bad, dude. I saw it, I thought, oh, I did all this cruel and unusual punishment there. But we're seeing today, because things are changing so fast, it creates enormous opportunities for us. And I think one of the keys for us is to learn how to communicate. I am honored to be here with this lady, Sharon, who's written this book. Have any of you seen this, How to Be a Super Communicator for Liberty? I have read this, and she's not, she didn't tell me to do this, but I'm going to go ahead and put a plug in here. It's about communication, and it's about how to get along with people. Here, we've got a camera there. If you want to zoom in on that, you could, right here. But this is a book that really helps me in practical business. It's not just for politics. Oh yeah, it'll work for that. It does a great job. But the principles are how to communicate and connect with people. And it really comes back to even what you were telling me, that it's about connecting with people as human beings. We see what they are, who they are, where they're coming from. Too often in the political realm, maybe you've seen this, we come in and we have read the right books. Hey, we, we know about John Locke and the rights of man, and we know about this, and we have the intellectual horsepower for it, but people aren't always persuaded by that. Have you noticed that? Sometimes the best argument doesn't win them over. I think what we've got to do is we have to adapt a different approach. One that is kind of familiar to me. I worked my way through, under, through high school and undergraduate school teaching martial arts. I was trained in Kodokan Judo and worked in that and I earned some extra money teaching that on the side. And there's a very important principle that I saw in that that I think applies directly to us and interfacing with other people and how they work. As a matter of fact, there's a principle I wanted to show. Um, sir, what is your name? 
What is your name? Eric. Eric, would you like to come up here for me? Just not wanted to have you help me out a little something here as we demonstrate some martial arts technique. Eric, are you okay? You feel like energetic today? Now, look at this. You see, if Eric and I, I'm sitting right here, Eric's a pretty, pretty good guy. I mean, I, if we met on the street, he could probably beat the tar out of me. Yeah, he's bigger than I am, pretty strong. He seems like a pretty strong guy, you know? But I want to show you something that's available, like a little trick that we use in judo. Right, Eric, you up for this? Yeah, okay, good. You got new hammer insurance up to date and everything. Now, I want you to hold your right hand up there, and I want you to push against my right hand, or my left hand here, with about one pound of pressure. Okay, now, I have a question for you. That's a lot of pound. Yeah, that's a big pound there. Question. Here's a mathematics question for you. If he presses against me with one pound, how much pressure do I have to put against him in order to just hold him steady? One pound. Equally. Hey, very good. There's a sharp group here. I like this. So one pound, there you do it. Now, he's bigger than me. You know, he can push a whole lot more. He can probably, you don't have to do it right now. But he, you know, if he pushed even more, I mean, I'd be in trouble, right? But here's a principle. If you take his strength plus my strength, it'll always be greater than his strength, right? So for instance, if he pushes against me just a little bit like that, but instead of fighting against him, I take his strength and pull it and come in Something like that with a throw, I'll throw you right now, right? Then I'm combining it, I can put the right uh, technique in there, and he can go flying against the wall. So thank you very much. Let's give him a nice round of applause for Eric. And you see, that's a key too often when we run into a challenge. Someone's opposing us, we want to fight them. We want to, they say, you know, we've got to help them. That's why we need government spending. We've got to do this, we want to come at it with, where are you going to get the money for that? Hey, you can't do that because then da 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 da. We go through all our arguments. You know what I'm talking about? But all we're doing then is fighting against him. And by nature, our human nature is we fight that, we resist it. But if instead you go, hey, I'm right there with you, we need to help the poor. I mean, first, if this is a libertarian group right now, how many of you feel that you would like to see the poor better off? Right? Yeah, we want to do it. So it's all in methodology, though, right? Rather than saying, well, yes, we need to use the force of a gun and take it from someone who has it and give it to the poor, that's not a good way to do it. Because eventually we know the logical ramifications, people that have the money that say, I'm not going to give any more or I won't earn it or whatever. But if instead, what if we put policies in place that allow the poor to become rich? They get better through their own efforts, maybe through charity because others have more money. We do it in a peaceful way. That's going to be the way we can do it. And I see that that is what true freedom, true liberty is all about. So I want you to think about that. Next time you're in that argument, instead of doing the natural thing is, well, I'll push against them, think in terms of, wait a minute, let me find those areas where I can agree with them and pull them over to our side. My feeling is that most people in their heart of hearts really are libertarian. I think they are. They believe in non-aggression principle for the most part, at least at a core element. As in my travels around the world, I often like to get together with other people, just a non-scientific, random sampling, get together with people, usually at a good local pub or a local uh, bar, wherever it might be, and after about the second or third local drink, you get the chance to find out what they're really like. And I often say, hey, I've got an idea. Here's what I want to tell you what you think of this. What if you lived your life with a policy, policy of do anything you want to do as long as you take responsibility for your actions and you don't harm another? How does that sound to you? In my non-scientific random sampling, I have never found a person that didn't like that. They think that sounds good. You know, now, of course, they kind of go different directions in other areas. But I think when we're talking to Democrats, progressives, liberals, they often call themselves liberals, etc., in that, if we can meet them where they are, I think they really do want to help the poor. They really do want some good ideals that we want in the long run. It's all about methodology. It's all about how we're going to get there. And so today we hope to have a discussion with you and a lot further conversation about what's the most practical way to do this. Let's think in terms of pragmatics. What can we do to pragmatically, practically help people who are more of the progressive, liberal, democrat persuasion to say, hey, we know where you want to go. And by the way, we want to go there too. What's the best way to get there and what's going to work? 
And to find out about even more of that, one of the things we're going to do is look at this book here and the lady who gave it to us. Who, again, I really recommend for your own de uh, development, not just for politics, but for your own business development. That's a book you want to read. And Sharon is a person who has done a lot. Let me get the uh, list. Oh, I've got this fresh, hot off the griddle. This is from her. She was a president of the Advocates for Self-Government for 20 years and was a co-founder of the Libertarian Party in Georgia. I had an opportunity years ago to work with her in many libertarian campaigns in the state of Georgia. I now live here in Orlando. I had a chance to work with her. She's the 2014 recipient of the National LP's Thomas Paine Award for Outstanding Communication of Libertarian Ideas. That is an honor. An author of the Amazon number one best-selling book, How to Be a Super Communicator for Liberty. Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow liberty lovers, join me in welcoming a dear friend of mine, a lady that I admire greatly, Sharon Harris. Thank you, Terry. Okay, um, one of the things we need to think about is when we're talking with people, we're specifically talking today about talking with people who call themselves Democrat or liberal, uh, liberal or whatever, that kind of label. And so there's a different way, as you know, there's a different way to appeal to them than you would appeal to someone who's a conservative or who is neither or, you know, kind of apolitical or whatever. So why is it that there is a difference there, do you think? Um, one of the things that I learned about, what, that I have studied extensively, is a thing called the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. Has anyone done this and, and learned, learned a little bit about it? And in that, as you know, it has 16 different personality types. But a gentleman named David Kersey narrowed that down to four temperament types. And I'm not going to go into detail about those because it's a, it's a full workshop that you can do to try to figure out which one you are and which one other people are. But what I found in my studies of this is that generally speaking, and of course we don't want to make sweeping conclusions about people, but generally speaking, People who call themselves liberals or who are attracted to liberal philosophy or Democrats or whatever tend to be what we call the intuitive feeling type, what we call a blue card because we kind of divided them among cards. And so we find that they, if, they, if we know that that person tends to be an intuitive feeler, we know how they like to be communicated with, which is a really good thing to know. And one of the things, they make decisions based on how that policy is going to affect people. They care about people and the consequences of action and how it will affect those people. They also want to help other people. They come from their heart. And libertarians have a tendency to come from our heads. And so when you have somebody who's coming from their head, talking to someone who's coming from their heart, Sometimes it just gets crossed up and the other person can't really even hear what you're saying. So we're going to, we're, one of the things we have to realize is if somebody does come from their heart and they do care about people, they are concerned that we might not care about people, that we may have different intentions. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that, about how you can do that. And Eva has some really good ideas about how to reach those people and she's going to share some of those with you. One of the things I would like to, to share with you is a technique that can help you establish rapport with people. And that's very important with someone who's coming from their heart to establish rapport, to know that you agree with them, that you have something in common. They like to be egalitarian, they like to be tolerant, and they like to know that you are as well. And so one of the things that we've learned over the years is this amazing technique called the Ransberger Pivot. So does anyone want to come up here and do the Ransberger Pivot with me? It's a dance and I know you know how to do it. Who wants to do it? Okay, I'm just kidding. It's not a dance and it's not a martial art either, unfortunately, so we can't do martial art on it. But what it is is a way of pivoting the discussion, okay? And what, what it is is when someone is asking you a question, and they are kind of hostile towards you. They're saying, yeah, you libertarians, 
You just wanna, you just wanna end schools. You just wanna, you just wanna have everybody doing drugs. You just wanna fill in the blank, whatever. And what they're saying to us is, you have bad intentions. You don't have the same values that I do. And they are hostile. A lot of times that's what they feel, is that we don't have the same values and the same intentions that they do. The Rensburger pivot is a way for you to pivot that around to show them that in fact you do have the same values, which is a very important beginning to a conversation. And so how you do that is, first of all, you have to listen to the person. You have to hear what they're saying so you can know what their intentions are, what their concerns are. So you have to kind of quiet and actually pay attention to what they're saying. You have to breathe. Relax, because we're often holding our breath, waiting for something to say, that we're going to say. But instead, to relax and breathe and listen to what they say. Make an accurate guess of what their concerns are. And you can tell by what they're saying what their concerns are. The person who says, you just, you even want to get, a, get rid of schools. What do you think their concerns might be? Schools. Kids. Kids. Education. Education. Absolutely. That's what they're concerned about. They're afraid that people are going to be ignorant and they're not going to be able to, to learn anything. So the next step you do is quickly figure out, do you share their concern? Do you, do you care about education? Of course you do. I mean, of course you do. So you have to find a way to relay that to that person. And the best way is to say, once you, once you see that you actually share their value, is to say, like you, I want our children to have the best education possible. Okay. Now, what that does is something that you kind of take the wind out of their sails of hostility because they can't say you don't, you know, you don't like education. You just explain to them that you do. And a lot of times people will just immediately say, oh, okay, and then wait for you to tell them what your solution is and they want to discuss their solution. So you, you have a wrap up rapport with that person when you show them that you share the same value. Then you have to go on and to answer the questions. So you have to do your homework to know what, how to explain separation of school and state and the solutions that libertarians have for education and so forth. But that pivot is just important to show them that you share the same values. So that's one of the techniques that you can use to do that. Um, then I'm gonna tell you one other one and then I'm gonna turn it over to Eva so she can, she can give you some some good tips as well. One of the things that I find when I'm talking about libertarianism is a lot of times people will ask you, they'll say, you know, I don't understand because, you know, sometimes you sound like a conservative. Sometimes you sound like a liberal. And you seem inconsistent to me. And so a lot of times people come up with the answer, and I've used this before too, is to simply say, oh, well, libertarians are fiscally conservative and socially liberal. Okay? And people can kind of understand that, but I have a much better way to put that. It really works amazingly well. And that is this, that when conservatives support free markets, they are libertarian on economics. And when liberals support civil liberties and peace, they are libertarian on social issues. And what I call this is the libertarian denominator, that you're measuring the views based on how libertarian they are. And what's interesting is that liberal you're talking to, all of a sudden, oh, I guess you know, in his mind, I'm, I'm libertarian on some things because I am socially liberal and so forth. So try that sometimes and just see how it works for you. And what happens is that person, see, they automatically know that they agree with you 50% of the time. You, if you point that out. And so that's one of the things that you need to do is show how you agree with them. And you do agree with them. But think of the average liberal. If they're truly a liberal, they're not just a, like, um, one of the problems with progressives, for example, is progressives really aren't liberals. They are really big government people. They think there's a solution in government for everything. So they tend to not even really care that much about civil liberties or about peace and harmony and so forth. They want government solutions for things. So you may find that you may have to take no for an answer when you talk to them sometimes. You may find that you don't have anything immediately in common with them. 
And so you might not want to waste your time trying to talk to them. But a lot of people who are Democrats, they're Democrats because they're liberal in the traditional sense of the idea that they, they're for people to be free what they, to do what they want to do. They're for freedom of speech. They're for civil liberties. And so the first thing you do is try to find out something that you agree with. You listen to them, ask them what their opinions are on something, you will find they're going to say something that you agree with. So the first thing is to say, I agree with you on that. What a wonderful idea that is. And talk to them a little bit more about it and let them share their ideas about that. And a lot of times that's all they need is to know that you do agree with them on something that's important to them. And always start with that. Libertarians, and sometimes we're going to try really hard to find the area we don't agree on so we can have an argument. And that's not the way to have a good conversation and a connection and a bridge to people. Because liberals and people who come from the heart and don't want to argue, harmony is very important to them. So we need to create that harmonious attitude and environment to make it safe for them to explore those ideas and share with us their concern so that we can then share with them our concerns our solutions to the problem. Sure. I just, I've been using methodology very simply. I just we call it retreat to common ground. Or so what I used to I, I was retreating when the conversation gets difficult. I just keep backing up the conversation to what's the value behind it? Oh, well, no, I share the value. I care about the kids or I care about it. And then I find that any time I can move back away from that, if the conflict occurs, then there's the harmony that I can always retreat to that common ground. Oh, that's so wonderful. I'm going to remember that phrase. I really like that. I'll yeah. share that with you. I find that it's very, it's very powerful. Yeah, that is very powerful. Okay, well, I'm going to let Eva talk a few minutes with you, and then we also want to open it up so that you can share things. And we have a couple of people in the room who actually came to Libertarianism from the Democratic Party. They're going to come and share with us what they're, what brought them, what, what turned them on to Libertarianism. So we'll have time to do that. So, Terry, you want to introduce me? And he was, uh, what is he really talking about? Stories. Stories, which are very important as a speaker. We know that it's an international way of connecting with others. By uh, using stories, you can do a lot. So I'm looking forward to learning a lot myself here. Yeah. Okay, um, I am a former Libertarian Party chair in one of the bluest places in the country, Boulder, Colorado. So if you don't talk to Democrats, you talk to the wall. There's, <laughs> there's not a lot of people there that aren't Democrats. Um, but what I want to talk about is something that is involved with what Sharon said in terms of understanding intentions. And that is one of the things libertarians do not do, and it's, it's sort of in their DNA, they don't really like to open themselves up to other people. You know, some Democrats will tell you, you know, what they had for breakfast on Facebook, you know, which, uh, which game they played all day when they were supposed to be doing work. You know, and libertarians tend to go, it's none of your business, leave me alone, I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about von Mises. You know, <laughs> and then I go right over there. Um, I have been using stories for quite some time. If you want to talk about the drug war, or you want to talk about what happens when there are people who are dependent and really need help, I tell them that I had a brother who was schizophrenic. He was on SSI for years. The reason he was schizophrenic was because there was a drug war. And he had friends who were doing LSD. And his friends who were doing LSD were so scared of the cops that they saw a police car. He was holding a batch of pills in his hand, or whatever format it's in. I have never done it, so I don't know. They said, quick, swallow it, the cops are coming. He spent the rest of his life with severe schizophrenia. Now, he was on SSI because it was obvious that he had major problems. He was on SSI for many years. Someone else took care of his money. And at one point, SSI lost his paperwork, or the local branch did. 
and he spent almost a year on the street. And a couple of years after that, you know, he started taking his medication regularly and he got a job. And I talked to him shortly thereafter and he said, damn it, I missed all those chances. I spent all that time figuring out how to play the victim so they would give me money. And until they dropped me on the floor, I trusted them to take care of me. I wasn't going to do anything. But then I started doing something and damn, I finally could accomplish something. I could really have a life of my own. I could make friends. I could get out and do all this other stuff. I wasted 20 years because that system creates dependence. And I never learned how to take care of myself until I absolutely had to. So for people who say, oh well, you know, the government can handle it. It's okay, it's a good thing. You know, you don't, you don't teach them that, what the libertarian stance is on it, but you teach them that it isn't always good. And sometimes the side effects of what you do are very damaging. So I have another story. I have a friend whose husband was in surgery and lost um, a lot of brain tissue due to a problem with the uh, anesthesia. He just got, you know, epoxy or something like that where the, where the brain didn't get enough blood. And he was damaged for a long time. And they tried to get him help through the system and through Medicaid and all this sort of thing. And then they found out there was a nonprofit that worked with, you know, brain trauma, and they ended up selling their house. She had to give up her business and everything else so they could qualify for Medicaid. And then she found out about the nonprofit, which she was never told about from the government at all. And they had a system where she could have gotten help and they wouldn't have to lose the house and she would have been able to keep her business. You know, so these are the kinds of stories. I bet you every single person in this room has a story about somebody they know that has either been screwed by the government or has had some kind of a problem that they, you know, that there's a libertarian answer to. Now some of you are younger, so you haven't been out there that much, you know, but you may know someone in your family who has. So does anybody have any stories that you can think of? And my friend Joe, who was going to come up here and tell his stories, is down there voting. I'll get him later. But do you understand the principle? Now, some of the things that I have thought about on this, I have put together a list. Everything that's on my phone anymore. What I want to talk a little bit about is motivations that a lot of Democrats have. I'm really prepared today. What makes Democrats feel good about their party and what negatives keep them from leaving? All of these are hooks that you can hang a story on. They want to be good guys. They want to save the victims and the poor people. They believe in sort of guiding other countries that are having problems and we can teach them how to do their water systems better or their, you know, other, other, get them democracy so that their people can be free, etc. They believe the government is the safety net. Now, I'm, I'm not saying every Democrat or progressive believes all this. I'm just saying these are some of the things that you will hear. The one problem is the ends justify the means. And if you have to do something that makes people dependent, you know, you don't always think about that part of it. It, it. The goal is to get the money or the goal is to get them help, and, and then you don't think about where it goes after that. They believe that criminalizing bad behavior works. And it doesn't, or it doesn't you know, when you're talking about murderers and so forth, putting somebody in jail is a good idea because they're harming others. But if they're just, you know, the thing about the kid who brings the water pistol to school and gets punished, you know, that's just nuts. But you can't tell them that. It's like, you have to say, what does this do to this kid when he's 
You know, he goes to school, he's playing with a toy, he doesn't think anything is wrong, and all of a sudden all hell breaks loose. What does that do to his psyche in the long run? Our team has good motives, but those other guys don't. And breaking up that bias is really hard, which is why you have to convince them of who you are before you can sell them anything. You know, you have to be a real person, you have to be an honest person. If you're telling somebody else's story, it doesn't really sink in. It has to be something that's yours, that you're sharing. And a lot of libertarians are not anxious to do this. Negative. Corporations and capitalism are bad. And you, you know, the Institute for Justice has this Story of the person who was a hair braider in the inner city. And the city required a huge amount of money for a license. And then, on top of that, they had to go to school to learn cosmetology in order to braid somebody's hair. You know, so people suddenly realize that, that sounds a little ridiculous. But how do you work your way into that? You know, when you're Maybe I had a conversation at the airport when I was coming here. You know how the cattle shoots there waiting to go through TSA? And this woman who was like 20-something was standing behind me. And I said, oh, where are you going? And she was going to visit her family. And she asked me where I was going. And I said I was going to the Libertarian Convention. And she said, I want to hear more about the Libertarians. I'm a Bernie fan, but I really want to hear more about the Libertarians. And I kind of went, OK. <laughs> So we were talking libertarian stuff on and off, you know, sort of I was telling my stories and she was telling her stories. And the funny part of the, about those cattle shoots is you're always opposite other people. And there were people leaning in to hear this conversation. It was very interesting. So I see somebody who has stories. Or not. Sure. Go for it. I <laughs> need a mic. <laughs> <laughs> I use the mic and I feel like you're done and it's scary. Um, Eva asked me, no, I'm serious. No, I need a mic, like, trust me. Yeah, I, I project. They'll hear me. You'll hear me. Um, maybe I'll stand back. They're recording. Yes, they're recording. No. Don't worry about it. Okay. Anyway, can you hear me? Recording? It um, doesn't matter. Okay. My, uh, it's not plugged through the uh, mic. Eva had asked me if I wouldn't mind coming up here, and I apologize that I'm late. I was watching this speech, and I don't want to watch the mic. Um, anyway, um, my story is, is one before um, I had discovered the Libertarian Party. I uh, was born and raised in New Jersey. Uh, met a girl who ultimately became my wife, but they had gone off friends, mostly, etc. Um, she had a um, horrible uh, car accident. Um, back in 93, um, she was passing her vehicle traveling um, roughly 60 miles per hour down the highway. And there was a Cadillac coming roughly 60 miles per hour the other direction on the highway. And a young boy just got his license right to the right of them, realized he needed to make a left, hit their car, drove her head on into the Cadillac. 60 and 60 makes 120 mile an hour impact. Uh, she was airlifted out of the, uh, out of the crash site horrible brain injury uh, to the point where brushing her teeth required her to stop and think, grab a toothbrush with hands, and manually brush teeth. Um, she did quite a bit of rehab. Uh, it's getting back to the point where she could brush her teeth, she could walk. Uh, we went on a, uh, I, I was a marathon runner um, at the time, and she would like to get out and exercise with me, and she went running with me. And I'm always faster than she was. We just had a rule that if I had to come to a fork in the road, had to make a right or a left, whatever, I would either leave an obvious sign, make some rocks, make a little arrow that I went that way, or that could be where I would take my break, and I would wait until she catches up. So I was at a fork in the road, and I was waiting for her to catch up, and it took uh, a little longer than I expected, so I went back, and lo and behold, her knees were all bloody, because I had run across a rock bed, um, that I didn't think twice about, and ran across the rocks, but her brain could not manage to get her run across the rocks. So what does all this have to do with that? Um, long before we discovered the Libertarian Party, but long before we started thinking about all these types of things, she's disabled, which we will not call her disabled, because that is grammatically incorrect. 
is a handicap. Disabled are the people that are in the graveyard. She'll tell you that <laughs> if I was disabled, I'd be in the graveyard. I'd handicap, I'd overcome that handicap, and I'm getting better every day. So with that said, she applied for um, Social Security uh, Disability, and of course she qualified for it. She had hired an attorney and got the Social Security Disability. Fast forward, as her cognitive rehab continued to work and she continued to get better and better to the point where she could maintain lifestyle and do back to work, there's rules with Social Security Disability that you can work X number of, of hours and you'll, you'll still continue to get Social Security Disability and then after you get to a certain point then you can come off of that. Great theory, right? We have all approve of such a thing, except you can't get off of Social Security Disability when you no longer need it. She literally had to hire an attorney in order to shut off the Social Security Disability benefits. Now, initially went down that road of the, she's afraid that because she's getting this money and she's already got a steady income, that they're going to come get her. But we find out it's the exact opposite. You, you want to do what? You don't want to collect checks anymore? Literally had to hire an attorney, cost us over $10,000 just to get her off of the rolls of Social Security Disability. So, <laughs> she is the loudest and proudest advocate of privatized uh, aid and assistance that there is because the Social Security Disability System, once you get in, getting back out again is nearly impossible. And just imagine the amount of waste that is taking place as a government run uh, aid system as opposed to if it was run in the free market where you say, Thank you very much for the help. Now that I can work, I'd like to help the next guy, which is the libertarian philosophy that she is a libertarian and she, if she were here today, I'm sure she would tell you that story. Sadly, we are a divorced in, so I can't speak for her at this point. But even though it knows that that's exactly the argument that she was making uh, when she was acting within the party of the fact that the government run aid is set up to make sure that you are permanently part of the needy class and that you can never work your way back out. And so that is the reason. That is, that is my story uh, for those who believe that helping is important in your life. There's far better ways of doing it than having some government bureaucracy money. So that's my story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm thinking from here, what would be really good is to tap into the stories that you have. Your questions, your ideas, etc. cetera. Sharon, does that sound like a good idea? Because I think one of the things we want to do is find out how you have been able to use communication, how you've been able, hi there. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh, you're, oh, you're, oh. <laughs> I apologize, I got wrapped up in the floor. Oh, okay. Well, so we want to hear from you, and also Ruth might have some things that she would want to say. Ruth, did you have something that you wanted to share with us? Well, I'm sorry that I missed this. I, I deeply apologize. I set the alarm in my clock and, oh well. That's all right. You're right up front, actually. You finished all of this. So well, it's your here, I'll tell okay. you. Ruth, I will give you this. Um, we're doing uh, vice presidential nominations, which has absolutely been fascinating. Uh, we have some fascinating characters. Um, we have women, we have Muslims, we have old white men, um, we have African Americans, we have uh, an amazing assortment. It's, it's just wonderful to watch the enthusiasm that's going on right now. The vote's about to start. If you are uh, delegates, you probably should pay attention, but I just want to, I'm sorry I missed this, but I want to tell you a little bit about my experience running for governor in Washington State. <sighs> so I catch my breath as I ran up here. In 2004, I was a libertarian candidate for governor in Washington State. I took a look at, and with the advice of some people in Washington State, took a, took a look at the candidates and decided that the Republican was moderately less odious than the Democrat by a nose. And who was that? That was Christine Gregoire, was the Democrat, and Dino Rossi was the Republican. So I sat down with a couple of people, and a friend of mine there, a gentleman by the name of Jay Mills, developed a strategy which he calls running to the right, running to the left. And this was likely to be a very close race. And any time there is a close race, libertarians should be able to determine who the winner would be. Now I'd like to say that we're gonna win every race we get into, but 
between you and me and the walls, <laughs> not likely. But if we can determine who's going to be the winner, that's a pretty powerful place to be in. And I'll take that as a, as a good runner up for winning. So in this race and talking to Jay, I decided to run hard to the left. I decided that I would try to take votes away from, or take votes that, for people who were more likely to vote for the Democrat. So I am a lesbian, and I ran hard on a platform of marriage equality. In 2004, I was the first candidate ever to have a statement in the voters right go guide in favor of, of marriage equality and decriminalization, decriminalization of marijuana. Two things that I would say the voters in Washington State have since passed by initiative. Well, you know, I was a piece of it. There were lots of good people doing this and lots of good people that took, took it on after I did, but at least I got a really solid conversation going. So those are my two big issues. And when everything settled out at the end of the campaign, I got around, I don't remember the figure, 65,000, 67,000 votes. The Democrat won by 132 votes. 132 votes. It had actually been 129. If you look at Wikipedia, it may still be 129. I keep going into correcting it. Someone else keeps putting it at 129. But there was a big lawsuit afterwards. I mean, this, it was fascinating. It was fascinating to be the, the person that totally screwed up the electoral system, this electoral system in Washington State for six months. It was fun. <laughs> but the, but just quickly, the, the Democrats listened to what the judge said in the court case, and he said, if you're going to show me that there were bad votes in this, that felons voted or whatever, you're going to have to actually bring me affidavits from felons. The Republicans didn't listen. The Democrats went out and got affidavits from four felons, three of whom said that they voted for the Republican, and one of whom said he voted for me, so I got 25% of the felon vote. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he awarded, the, he took those votes away from the Republican, and... Uh, so the, the Democrat ended up winning by 132 votes. So this running to the left, running to the right is really important. I'm going to add one thing in there is the same Jay Mills went to the Republican campaign and said, you know, if you guys pay for a mailing to the LGBT community, take out some ads in the Seattle Gay News or Ruth, you're probably going to win because it's a close race. You peel off half a percent in King County, in Seattle, very strong Democrat stronghold, you're likely to win. And the candidate said, that's a great idea. And his campaign manager said, ah, I don't think so. And he lost by 132 votes. <laughs> My point in telling this story is we do have opportunities in talking to Democrats and also talking to Republicans, but there are also opportunities to build bridges. There are opportunities to go to a campaign and say, you know, I'd rather your guy win. Now, I don't have the, the money, the finance, the structure that you do, but if we can work together, we can probably take out that guy, take out the Democrat, or take out the Republican. In a close race, libertarians should always be able to be that balance of power. And that's a really strong place to be in, and I urge you to take a look at this idea of running to the right, running to the left, because it's an incredibly powerful tool. All right, thank you. Very good story. I like that. Running to the right, running to the left. Sounds like being able to adapt to whatever the situation is. That's what libertarians have. We, we can do that. So yeah. you, want to, you want to take out a Republican, you might want to talk about, um, uh, you might want to talk about uh, tax issues. You know, can we have can we have a better tax situation? So talk, you can talk about, okay, they're on the shelf. I mean, I've been called a boomerang before. Um, but you can talk about tax issues. You can talk about uh, property rights issues. Uh, you could talk about um, it, small businesses and, and how small businesses are, uh, are important. It's anything to appeal to someone from a Republican side of the political spectrum. And again, it's, if you talk about those fiscal responsibility issues, you're more likely to connect with, with, with Republicans. If you talk about those social issues, if you talk about heart issues, you're more likely to connect with Democrats. So choose, you can choose. And as libertarians, we have a great deal of flexibility about the issues that we can pick. So if you're running for office, particularly in a close race, take a look at what issues are more likely to further liberty. 
And in some cases, again, I wish we would win more often, but if we don't, being that balance of power, and being able to say, you know, if you ever look at that 2004 race in, in Washington State for governor, this is what I can do for you. So, um, again, and I can, I can tell more stories, but I want, want you to go on, so thank you. Very good, thank you. And I think really when you think about it, we've got a wonderful position because those that are really far over on either side of the progressives, Democrats, the conservative Republicans, they don't have as much uh, wiggle room. Can we use that? Wiggle room. We, however, are not wiggling. We're fully embracing what they feel on either side when it comes to freedom and liberty. We're consistent on that. And so what I want to do is tap into some ideas that you have. If somebody had your hand up, do you want to mention what's your name, sir? Sterling. Sterling. Sterling, come on here. I'm from Orlando, I'm here. We're in Orlando. Right, over in the Amish Creek area. Oh, we're not South Phillips. Coast. Okay, yeah. Um, I just wanted to echo that um, Robin uh, Kerner yesterday, who did a great speech on breaking paradigms, uh, was echoing much the same sentiment you were saying earlier, that there's a lot of, if the Libertarian Party controls that 10 to 20% swing vote in the middle, it really magnifies, you know, by a factor of potentially 10, the power of the Libertarian Party and the electorate by being able to control races all over the nation. Um, even if we don't win, we can control the race. And it's so, and it's so powerful. It's that, it's that 2 to 5% of the vote. Yeah, even less when it's very close. Um, and and uh, as well, this idea that there's many people that when you go look at it are actually libertarian uh, under the core. Um, he made this, I, I don't remember which study he was able to cite, but there's done some neuroscience research. And the neuroscience research shows that uh, libertarians look more like Democrats than they do look like Republicans from a brain science standpoint. Um, with the one caveat that um, libertarians look more like, um, use more of the logic center or the rational center, as opposed to the emotion, which references what you were saying earlier about the myers type indicator with feeling and thinking. Still like that. Yeah, right. yeah. um, I had a nice little bibliography with many, many books that had lots of stories in them, but I'd like to mention just a few. Um, I do have a printout that's in my room. So if you want one, uh, let me know and I'll email it to you. Or you can pick it up, you know, I'll bring it and have it around with me if you're here tomorrow or tonight. One book that's very, very important is something called the, um, wait a minute, let me think of it. The author is Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. It's called The Righteous Mind. He is a, uh, clinical psychologist who did a lot of studies. And his take on the whole thing is that picture an elephant with somebody trying to steer it. The elephant is the id, the emotions, um, the all, all the biases that you picked up from your parents and your environment. And the rider is your reason. And in many, many cases, the first thing that picks up on anything that goes wrong is the emotion. And the elephant just takes off all by itself. And the rider ends up in the unenviable position of trying to make a rationalization for why the elephant did that. Um, and it's a fascinating book about like how tribes form and what kinds of things you can do to break down. I mean, we are in a tribal, almost a tribal war of ideas at this point in time. And trying to figure out how to break down those kinds of barriers is important. I just wanted to go back to Ruth about the issue of, yes, it's important to take away the votes, but also just to the point of running to get the discussion going. Um, I ran for state house rep in 2004 in Georgia, and um, basically lost because I wouldn't speak against um, gay marriage. Um, it's heavy in the Republican area. But, you know, I just thought it was important to be out there and standing up for the, the issues, standing up, bringing the libertarian point of view to light, because um, otherwise it just doesn't get mentioned. I mean, if, well, even at this point, because Gary's been nominated and, and is not the candidate, I think that the discourse between um, between Hillary and, and Trump is going to change a lot. And certainly if he gets into the, into the um, uh, debates, you know, it's not whether he wins or not, it's whether he moves the discussion. And so you move the discussion significantly, probably really, or 
significantly um, responsible for that being those things now being legal in Washington State. So I really applaud you. If you would just address that, please. I'm real big on setting intentions. And I think it's important when we run for office to try to figure out what is it we want to accomplish. And there are lots of reasons to run for office. One is just to give people a choice. One is to get a libertarian message out there. One is to start a discussion about various issues. One is to, you know, piss off the other libertarian that was running for that office that you didn't want. You know, there are lots of reasons. There are lots of reasons to run for any office. But I think if you're really clear about what your intention was, my intention in this race was to make sure the Democrat lost. And I came within a whisker of doing that. Now, a lot of Republicans in, in Washington State still blame me, because my brother got involved in, in Washington State politics as a Republican, and people say, Bennett, are you related to that Ruth Bennett that caused us to lose? And it was, it was hard for him, but we had, we had a PhD student do some statistical analysis of, of where I got votes, and according to his analysis, if I had not been in the race, the Democrat would have won by better than 20,000 votes. So I made the Republican look good. And four years later, same Democrat, same Republican, no me, and the Democrat won by 22,000 votes. So I did take votes that otherwise would have gone to the Democrat. And they're not Democrat votes. I took votes that would have gone to the Democrat. There are no such things as Republican, that's, that's another reason to run for office, is to educate people about what their votes. We need to, we need to work more strategically because we don't have the money and we don't have the backers and we don't have the infrastructure. To spend a whole lot of time as a Democrat, um, a Democrat presidential candidate running in Texas to try to get those electoral votes is really, it's really a huge waste of money. Um, to, be, to be a libertarian and to spend all of your, you know, to, to try to run as a libertarian candidate in a lot of places expecting to win, it's just not gonna happen. Roughly 37% of the population is going to vote for any Democrat. Roughly 37% of the population is going to vote for any Republican, regardless of their qualifications, regardless if they're dead, it doesn't matter. Which doesn't leave right now the Libertarian Party a lot of wiggle room. So focusing on those races where we really can have an impact, understanding what your intentions are, what is it you're trying to accomplish? And what you're just trying to accomplish is to build your email list. That can be a really good thing to do. If what you're trying to, to do is actually to sway public opinion on a particular topic, and you can say, well, I've got 5% of the vote, but our research says that those 5% those of the vote are strongly opposed to this new tax you want to propose, Mr. Democrat. If I'm not in the race next time, don't think that you're going to get those votes. I mean, there are lots of ways of strategically looking at voting. So I think that's something that as libertarians, I mean, you're always glad when you have a candidate willing to step up into any race. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of line holders. I have been a line holder. But I can tell you, a few years ago, when I decided to run for my local school board, and I'm now on my local school board, in fact, I'm president of my local school board, that feels even better. So it's, it's looking for the places where you can make a difference, where you can step up, where you can serve, where you have a chance, at least in some way, of turning things, however slowly, in a more libertarian direction. So again, it, I really urge libertarians to think strategically. Are you better off running for office, or are you better off actually putting your time and money into a candidate who's running in a close race and can make a difference? More is not always better. Strategic is always better than random. There are two pieces to this puzzle. One of them is getting elected, or as he says, making a difference around you. The other one is winning hearts and minds. Um, one of the reasons for running for local office is people see you out there. People know that you care, you want to do something. You don't just want to tell them what was in a book and why don't you do your life like that. Um, the more exposure we get to people, I mean, I've had people go, oh, you're a libertarian. I thought you were reasonable. <laughs> we talked about when we were putting this together was one important thing to appeal to the people who are liberal and who care about people is to be involved in your community, to be a good neighbor, to be a good friend, to be 
to be out there when people need things in your community and participate in your community. And it's really magical that you'll find that once people like you and know you as a good person, they're much more open to hearing what you have to say about politics. Um, so, so it gives you a good opening. Yeah. Um, the person who got me really excited since I'm standing here already into politics was a professor I had in college. And uh, he did his PhD thesis on the Chicago Daily Machine, the corrupt Chicago Daily Machine, how they could get whoever they wanted voted whenever they wanted all the time. And so one of the people he interviewed was a guy um, who was a key figure in the Chicago Daily Machine, and the guy didn't know how to read and write. And yet he was an important part of the Daily Machine. And his job every day was he would walk the districts he was responsible for and stop in and visit the butcher and stop in and visit the, the, each of the store owners and visit the families. Do you need anything? Are your kids okay? Are Sally and John okay? And he literally took care of everybody in his neighborhoods. So when he came around the lot of election time, he says, by the way, we'd really appreciate it if you voted for John Smith. Guess who they voted for? John Smith. Had, nothing, had everything to do with it. The person who took care of them and that looked out for them day to day was the person that they listened to when it comes to the vote. Yeah, I'm reminded of what uh, Tip O'Neill said. Remember Tip O'Neill, Democratic uh, Speaker of the House from Massachusetts, when he said those very important words, all politics is local. What people care about is, did you uh, get do something to fill that pothole there on our street? Did you get Social Security for my great aunt? You know, those kind of things are really important. You know, I want an explanation mark on what you said about personal stories. So important. And I find that often I heard, maybe you heard this as well, during the time when we were debating about Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, over and over I heard people use personal stories, personal anecdotes. Whereas we as libertarians, we generally say, wait a minute, you've got this, and the macro, you have, and uh, economics, and, da, 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 and von Mises, got to throw that in there somewhere, and von Mises did this, etc., which was all true. But for them, it was my Aunt Lulu needed surgery, and she couldn't get it, and therefore we need to have it. Did you, can you all relate to that? That's what they talked about. And I think, even you know, what you said is so important, we've got to come from our personal story. And it's something we tend to shy away from. It is, yes. And it's the heart of where we are. But we don't have to abandon our core beliefs in sound economics and non-aggression principle. We just make sure that we blend that in there as well. Very important. We've only got a few minutes left, about two minutes according to my watch here. Any stories, any comments, criticisms, uh, agreement, disagreement that you want to add before we wind down? All right, don't you wish we could go like forever? You know, a few more hours on this, it'd be really wonderful. And a uh, round of applause for our panel members here. Excellent. Uh, Mr. And we know that today, also, uh, Sharon, we haven't heard from you. I'm not going to let you get out of here, figuring out ways. Of, do you take, like, fiat currency for this? Bitcoin or gold, silver, whatever, fungible commodities? You can negotiate some form of communication and trans transaction with her. Silver price is $20, but for you, $10 today if you want to buy coffee. And, uh, and so I would like to give you the chance to do that. And if anyone would like to give me their name and email address, I'm going to keep you informed of new books that come out or trainings that are available in your area. Let me put something in here. I'm a speaker and I talk a lot about communication, how to get better. One of the most important things is when you have an opportunity to improve your life, you don't do it by wishing. You don't do it by thinking about it or hoping. Hope is not a good strategy. I would encourage you, part with the coins that you have. Ben Franklin said this really well. He said, pour the coins of your purse into your mind, and your mind will overflow your purse with coins. Invest in yourself. And here's an opportunity. I'm going to say, I've read this, and Jaron didn't ask me to do any of this, but 10 bucks, come on, you're going to blow 10 bucks on something else. This can help you to become not only a better person communicating politically, but in your own personal life. So I want you to kind of think about that and how you can invest in yourself. Any other questions or ideas? By the way, if you want to reach me, my address is real simple, terry at terrybrock.com. You can drop me an email, terry at terrybrock.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Sharon, anything else you want to add? That's about it. It's just mainly that just to remember that people, that people do make decisions from their heart, for the most part and particularly liberals do and Democrats do. So learn to, learn to live there some 
it's, it really actually makes you feel good too, because you end up enjoying more of life when you are coming from the heart and really care. And it shows up in your eyes and your face when you smile. And that's the other thing to do is just is to smile at people and do like he did. Live in agreement. Live where, where the agreement is. Yeah. And then you can go from there. But I think you as long as you share, as long as you share your passion, other people will want to know about it. It's, it, it. I urge people to be as as passionate as Jeffrey Tucker. To aspire to that. Okay? If you've ever heard Jeffrey Tucker speak, uh, his passion is so amazing and so obvious, and you just are attracted to him. I want to get some of what he's got. So, so I think that that's really important to share your joy, your passion, and uh, your excitement about this wonderful philosophy. So go out and do it. And I appreciate you all that you're doing. And thank you again. One thing I do want to mention, though, if you do get a chance, I have to put this in there. I'm going to be uh, uh, encouraging you to uh, continue this discussion throughout the year. One of the ways that we'll do this will be at Freedom Fest. How many of you have heard of Freedom Fest? And I'm very biased toward it. I'll be the master of ceremonies this year there. And Gina has some um, material here for you. So we would love to see you, but really want to stay in touch. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you.